The story really starts when I was eight years old. So I was always a child that was confident, cheeky, energetic, outspoken in class, doing well at school. We had a nice family home in a part of London and everything was going really nicely. At home, my life started to change when my parents started having some trouble in their relationship. Now, my dad was actually helping out a friend from work um, with accommodation, which worked out really well because my dad was a doctor and he would now and again be on call and would need to be called out to see patients. It was a really helping hand because this way there was an adult in the house sometimes to look after me. Now this adult was 25 years old. He was a nurse working in the local hospital and he really took a liking to me and he really went for it. And this is when the sexual abuse started. He would do this when my dad was at work so no one else was in the house. He made me feel really comfortable with it all. And we think to ourselves like, how do you even get an eight year old to be comfortable when doing those types of things? And it's the grooming process. Like it's so powerful, but also the grooming process is a very clever process with young children. So maybe he would touch me on my leg and keep doing that until that felt normal for me. And then maybe he'd move that onto hugs and keep doing that until that felt normal for me. Or maybe it was with words. Maybe he'd praise me or give me compliments or dare me to do something and make it into a game and then progress it stage by stage from there. Like we really don't know. The only person that has the answer to those things is him. But what he managed to do, he managed to do very well because he got me to a stage where we were doing things completely naked and I wasn't questioning a thing. Now this abuse lasted for two years. It finished when I was 10 years old and it finished when he moved away. Now I don't actually remember it being a significant moment that he moved away. It didn't really feel like, oh, the abuse has stopped. My life just continued. And I continued as the boy that I had always been before the abuse, during the abuse and after the abuse. I was showing no signs. It was almost like from the outside, the abuse hadn't affected me at all. Now I moved into my school life and I was doing really, really well. Then I went to college and got good grades there too. I decided that engineering would be a good idea. I started interviewing, I got some offers and I got an offer and took a job at a company called Marshall Aerospace here in Cambridge in England. Now when I moved into my 20s, I started getting really good at my job, which meant I started getting paid well which meant that the weekends started to become a lot of fun. We would all, me and my mates would all race home um, from a Friday after work and we'd just get into the pub and start partying. Life was going so, so well. Great friends, great career, but then something changed when I turned 25. I started experiencing these low bouts of sadness. Like I wasn't sure where they were from. Then I realized that it was the abuse. It was back. Like, I'd never really forgotten about it. Something would come up on the news that would remind me of it. Something would come up in conversation that would remind me of it, but I just didn't care. I was having a good time. I decided that my strategy would be to keep pushing these memories away because eventually they're gonna disappear, right? But they didn't. I spent two years trying to do this. They turned into flashbacks. They turned into nightmares and night terrors. Like things got really, really bad. When the abuse was happening at the height of it, I never told anybody. I knew that I was to keep it a secret. Now, I don't actually remember him actually telling me verbally that I am to keep it a secret. It's just like I knew that that was gonna be the case. Now we were doing some things that gave me good physical responses, the hugging, the fondling, the touching. They felt soft, they felt caring. Things would change when it was my turn to do things to him, when it was my turn to kiss him in certain areas. I just remember thinking that's gross and disgusting, but I still never told anybody at the time that it was going on. So my parents never picked up on anything that was going on. I really was showing no signs. No teachers ever picked up on any behavioral traits that were abnormal. So I never wanted my parents to ever find out about what was going on. I tried to prosecute this man that did this to me. After the years of speaking out to friends and, and um, really coming to the terms of what happened, the prosecution attempt began and it was looking weak. There really was no evidence. It just was ending up as my word against his. Now I know that this makes us angry Historic cases are always ending up like this, but honestly, there really is no evidence. 
There's no recordings, there's no forensics, there's no messages. So when this happened and the police were saying that the prosecution attempt was looking weak, and I knew I wanted to continue prosecuting. When I knocked on the door, he opened the door and he was excited to see me like usual. And when we sat down at the table in the kitchen, I just went straight in with it. And I said, dad, look, I've got something to tell you that you're gonna find really, really difficult. And when I told him about what happened, he pulled this face that I'd never seen on him before. He started rocking back and forth uncontrollably and let out this scream of pain. Once I told my father, I decided that my mother should know as well. Her life will never ever be the same. I'm pretty sure she wakes up every morning thinking about this, the what ifs, what did she do wrong. I spoke out for the first time to a close friend when I was 27 years old. My life started to change when I turned 25. I started experiencing these low bouts of sadness and I wasn't sure where they were from. Now I sat with them for a little while. Now I sat with these memories for two years because I thought if I keep pushing them to the side, they're gonna just disappear and I can get back to my normal life. But it really wasn't working. These memories turned into flashbacks, which turned into nightmares and then night terrors. I was in a pub with a couple of mates and I thought to myself, just tell them now. But I just couldn't get the words out. I sat him down and I said, mate, you are never gonna believe what happened to me when I was younger. Now he could have guessed a thousand times. He would have never got anywhere close to the answer. He gave me the perfect response. He showed every emotion, sadness, frustration, anger, disappointment even, but he didn't panic. He didn't make it about him. He gave me my space to talk and he listened. He told me that he will not tell anyone unless I need him to, and that he will be there for every step of the way from here on it out. Now, I woke up the next morning and I couldn't believe how good I felt. I felt stronger, I felt lighter. So I told another friend and another friend. And what's really interesting is the more that I spoke, the more confident I was with telling the story. Now, I spent approximately three or four years speaking to different people about the story. So I started searching for him because I wanted to find out. And I found his Facebook profile and there he was with his wife and his two daughters smiling at Christmases and smiling on holidays. I literally couldn't believe it. It made me feel so angry to see him again. So I continued looking at his face, staring at it, forcing myself to face that fear. And he hadn't changed one bit. I'd write him a message. I said to him, you are to come and meet me because we've got to talk about what happened all those years ago. And if he doesn't get back to me within 24 hours, I've got no choice but to report the crime to the police. I come back two hours later and he blocked me. I literally couldn't believe it. So I pick up the phone and I call the police and I report the crime. They needed to know as much information as possible. Police kicked off the investigation. They put him under voluntary arrest. They called him and told him that accusation and asked him to come to the station. He gave his statement. And of course, he denied it. I mean, who's admitting to this? The police tried everything. The case had to be closed. There just was no evidence. The man that did this to me was put on voluntary arrest. He was called, told the accusation and asked to come to the station. That gave him enough time to delete anything that he had on his computer that could have been used as evidence. Now that opportunity has gone forever. Now I came across a story from an 80 year old woman. She told that she never ever managed to tell her story because she comes from an era where you could not speak about this even if you wanted to. She talked about how the suppression of her story really hindered her life in so many different ways. And I thought, hang on a minute, I come from an era where you can speak about this kind of thing. I actually ended up quitting my career because I wanted to commit fully to taking my story public. I had an idea. Now coincidentally, two weeks before this, I'd been to an open mic night in London and I thought I'll go as a storyteller and start telling my stories on the stages to live audiences around London. I got on the stage, I look out into the audience and I deliver my five minute story the best I could. I was stumbling all over the place. I was so nervous but when I finished the crowd cheered. They roared. They stood up and clapped. I couldn't believe it and that's when I knew I was on the correct path. I couldn't get enough of this. I started speaking at more events 
any events that I could find, sometimes three or four times a week. I didn't care whether it was a busy cocktail bar in the centre of London with full of musicians. I was speaking. I was still angry that he denied it. Now I sat with my friends and started talking about this. I started expressing how I felt about it. And I said, I want to confront him to his face. Now, I never liked this idea because it felt like trouble. I managed to find his address. I saw the house. The light was on. The car was in the drive. So I could presume that he was in, possibly. But I had to take my chance. So I parked my car up. I walked up to the door and I knocked. The porch light came on. A key turned the door lock from the inside. The door opened and it was him. He recognized me instantly. Went to slam the door shut, but I managed to hold it open, get my foot in front of it, and now it was wedged open. And I said, I started saying everything that I always wanted to say to him. He was trying to shout over my voice, trying to drown out my words, kept trying to slam the door shut. And I said to him, just calm down for a moment, will you please? And I kept saying everything that I always wanted to say to him. Now in the background, his wife was calling the police. It must have sounded like absolute chaos on the phone. It wasn't long until the police arrived. Three police cars, blue lights, sirens. They jump out of their car and they come at me. And I said, that's the man that was sexually abusing me when I was a child. And I've come to speak to him about it. And it kind of changed everything. Their body language changed towards me. It was almost like this truth had struck them straight in the heart. They asked me some questions. They went and asked him and his wife some questions. So I was handcuffed, put in the back of the police car, arrested and taken to the station. As I spent the night in the cell, I looked up at the ceiling thinking, this is not a good situation to be in. However, I got my time in front of him to say everything that I wanted. And at the very least, I've sent a shiver up his spine that if he's still doing this to more children, then he better think twice because we will not stand for this anymore. So with this part of the story where I'm now speaking in schools to young people, where I do explain everything that happened and everything that happened with the prosecution, there's been some questions in my own head of whether I should keep this knocking on the door part in, in the story or whether I should remove it. Because of course, I'm not trying to endorse any young people to go around knocking on anybody's door. Now I put a poll out on my social media to see what my audience think. And 98% of them came back and said, you've got to keep it in there. It's authentic. It's gripping. You're going to grip those young people into a narrative that usually they're not gripped into. And actually, they're going to they're gonna suss you out if you start lying to them or keeping things out of it. So keep it in. And at, in summary, what it actually shows is it shows strength in the face of the people that are doing this. Because I feel like often we're afraid of these people as if they're, we kind of put them on this pedestal as if they're like some kind of mega threat. They're just other people. And why shouldn't we confront them? Why shouldn't we stand up in front of them? Like I'm a grown man now. I'm not that boy anymore. The irony of this situation is I tried to prosecute him for what he did to me when I was eight years old. I tried for nine months to pursue that prosecution attempt and I got absolutely nowhere. But when he went to prosecute me, I was arrested and taken to the station immediately and charged. Now, I got a trial date at Magistrates Court here in England. When the trial started, they listed the charges. It was stalking for finding out where he lived, harassment for the times I'd messaged him asking him to come and meet me, and assault for the red mark I left on his chest when I pushed the door open when he went to slam it on me. Now, of course, I pleaded not guilty to all of these charges. The court day started with everybody looking at me like I was the criminal. I would like I was some madman going around knocking on people's doors for an accusation that had already been investigated and closed. But as the court day evolved, things started to change. He was up for questioning first and he couldn't answer some of the simple questions like can you confirm what this man was doing at your door of course he couldn't answer that question because he'd expose himself in the answer now when it was my turn to be questioned i stood up with a straight back answered those questions honestly and truthfully because i've got nothing to hide now the verdict came out i got not guilty for the stalking and harassment but guilty for the assault. They gave me a thousand pound fine and a restriction order. Now my barrister said that that was a slap on the wrist because they had to be seen to be giving you something. You cannot go round knocking on people's doors for an accusation that's already been investigated and closed. And I'm like, 
fair enough. Walking to my car, I got in the car park and I could hear some footsteps behind me. And I got a tap on the shoulder and it was his barrister. He said to me, well done for today. And by the way, I've seen everything that you're doing online. You're doing a phenomenal job. Go get it. So even he knew what was really going on. I was 32 years old when I decided to confront him because I'd just had enough. So with this part of the story where I'm now speaking in schools to young people, where I do explain everything that happened and everything that happened with the prosecution, I talk about the abuse. I talk about telling my parents. I talk about the recovery. I talk about my career. I talk about everything. They're so interested. And isn't that what we want? What I want to do is I want to leave them with a memorable story that they'll never, ever forget. So if they're already experienced abuse in their past, they can get some strength from my story. If they're experiencing sexual abuse at the moment, they can get strength from my story. I've been knocking on school's doors for the past two years, trying to get them to let me come and speak in front of their young people. There's been a lot of hesitancy, and I understand why. People are not sure what you're going to say about this very sensitive topic. In 2021, I launched a new movement called Something to Say. Now, what I created was a space for other people to share their stories. And the reason why I did that is because I got so much confidence in sharing my own. I wanted to give other people the opportunity to do the same. But I kicked off the, the platforms and people started writing in with their stories. And it really had a strong vibe to it. People were talking from a position of strength and courage because that's what I try to promote on my own pages. And now we've created this incredible community. Some people are sharing their stories, for, sometimes for the first time. Some people are giving us information. It's a, it's a place of resource, inspiration, strength and courage. And I want to continue this. I started to get some volunteers wanting to help me some brilliant people who are now on the team. And we decided that, okay, so we're posting a story nearly every day. And um, some people like reading those stories. and But some people want short and sharp information. Some people want to see something visual. So we actually started asking our audience, do you want to submit some writing, a poem, some art? Do you want to record a short video about you talking about the topic in any way? And that's become really interesting because then we started getting therapists, counsellors, doctors who've been in this field for 20 years coming and telling, saying what they've got to say. I've also now launched some merchandise, some something to say merchandise. Now in 2018, this was an early idea of mine. I wanted to create something that people could wear that they feel proud to wear. None of the clothing says abuse on it. We're not interested in trying to... Uh, 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 be so blunt like that. We, we've got some other slogans. You should check them out on my website, jeremyindica.com. And we've got things, things we've, we've got a hoodie that, for example, the most popular one that says unspeakable. And people are wearing it and they're like, yeah, come on, we're representing speaking out. We're representing breaking the silence. But they don't have to feel a bit afraid because it doesn't say child sexual abuse on it, for example. So we're really trying to add different elements to this project. I've also got the Jeremy Indica work where I'm really trying to push here. Last month, I released a short film called Staying Silent. You've got to check it out. You've got to see what we managed to do there. You're going to see how we managed to film it. It has flashbacks in it where we got a child actor and an actor that played the perpetrator. And then you've got me, it flashes back to present day. And I'm talking to the lawyer trying to get a prosecution attempt. And then it flashes back to the past where I was being abused. And you should see how it's filmed. People are saying it's incredibly gripping and they've never actually watched anything that ha has helped them visualize what can actually go on. But also with the parts of the present day, it also helps show how the life of a survivor is when they try to report and they're not believed. It takes an average 20 years for an adult to disclose their abuse. And a lot of people think about why. I didn't disclose until I was 27. The abuse finished when I was 10 years old. A lot of people ask me, why did it take you that long? And what initiated that speaking out? And I think it's two things amongst the other things that I've talked about today. A psychologist told me that when you experience something horrific and traumatic as a child, there's no way that your brain is at a stage that it can deal with that. So what it does is it cleverly boxes the memory up for you locks the box and puts it to the back of your mind. And then when you come of a maturity, it starts to bring the backs 
box back. It starts to bring the box back to the front of your mind and just starts releasing some of the memories for you to deal with because this has to be de dealt with at some point, whether that's in your teenage years, your 20s, your 40s, your 60s. Your brain knows that. But also, I think at the time that I started thinking about this a lot, I think I saw someone that looked like him, you know. I was working in Dubai at the time. I was running some modifications on a few aircraft that we had out there. And I'm pretty sure I saw somebody that looked like him. Same kind of hair, same kind of glasses. And I think a combination of all of these things, my age, the stage of life that I was, the way my brain was working, and possibly this trigger of seeing somebody that looked like him was all in contribution to actually speaking out about it.